Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you from Islamabad in Pakistan with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our subject today is entitled Implications for Islam of the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan. And uh, it is the last lecture that I will be delivering on this visit to Pakistan. We started late in March, more than four months ago. And we want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made it possible for me uh, to visit Pakistan and to spend this long period of time here. And we also want to thank our team of volunteers in every city in Pakistan who have worked so hard to make it possible for all this work to be done. May Allah bless them all. Amen. The implications of the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan are uh, immense. There are implications, enormous implications for India as well as for Pakistan, as well as for Iran, as well as for China, as well as for Russia, as well as for Israel. <laughs> as well as for the whole of the modern Western world. And we are on the verge now of what witnessing events rapidly unfolding in Afghanistan. I never thought they would unfold so rapidly, which would make the coming weeks and the coming months enormously important for those who have the capacity to analyze the implications of what is happening in Afghanistan. Today, we are going to restrict ourselves only to the implications for Islam. I delivered the lecture one week or a week and a half ago in Lahore, but the re recording was defective. And that is why we have to repeat the lecture today. But there are follow-up lectures I would love to deliver in which we can analyze what is happening in Afghanistan in terms of international politics. So don't ask me questions today on international politics and Afghanistan because that is not our topic. Rather, we are focusing on the implications for Islam and I have an intelligent audience who will not stray from the topic despite whatever enthusiasm you have to stray. And the first implication of this event in Afghanistan, the defeat of the United States for Islam is enormously important. More than 75 years ago, one of the most famous historians of the modern Western world, a man of impeccable scholarly integrity, Arnold Toynbee, British historian, 
He wrote a book entitled Civilization on Trial. And you can get the book on the internet. You can download it if you check for it. I suggest to you, it's a good book to read. He was not just a British historian, he was a Christian. And he was a man with some Christian piety. He was also someone who was carefully observing international affairs, political affairs. And he was, he was um, selected by the British Royal Society for International Studies to, to edit the survey of international affairs that they were publishing every year. I don't know whether you can find it here in Islamabad, but in Karachi, at the Institute of International Relations, there in the library, I found it. The volumes which were published for every year, 1920, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, edited by Arnold Toynbee. A mine of information, scholarly information, very important. And this is what Arnold Toynbee revealed when he wrote Civilization on Trial. He said of modern Western civilization, that it had, it had come to the world to replace all previous civilizations. That history had reached its com its com its com its its its, its, its it has completed, and there's nothing more to come that all previous civilizations, including the civilization of Islam, are now obsolete and more abundant belong to the museums of history. <laughs> and the world will witness nothing more from now on than the ascendancy of modern Western civilization. Well, look at that. Afghanistan has just delivered, or is now delivering, a spectacular repudiation, a spectacular repudiation of that thesis of the modern West, that Islam is a spent force. Rather, Afghanistan has delivered the evidence that Islam is still alive. Not only that, but Islam has the capacity to resist, to resist the most powerful civilization that history has ever witnessed. Because it was not just United States, in Afghanistan. It was the whole of the West and all their client states. The, what you call in Pakistan the Chamchas of the West. And so the Republic of Turkey was in Afghanistan. All these years. If Pakistan needs to be reminded of that, well, I'm here to remind you of that. That Erdogan's Republic of Turkey was in Afghanistan all these years as a chamcha of the West. And uh, the Afghan Muslim people fought the West for 20 years. And the reason why the United States has to leave now is because they are scared of a public relations disaster. Because on the 11th of September, 
it will be 20 years since they invaded Afghanistan. And how did they do it? Yes, you know the story. And I am not afraid to tell it while others are afraid. I've never been afraid to tell it. That there are three kinds of lies. You know it. There are normal lies. And then there are great lies. And then there is 9-11. So they invaded Afghanistan with a mountain of a lie. <laughs> In order to be able to pursue a political agenda. And 20 years later, they have to withdraw in failure. And so a message is being sent all around the world. And my voice here from Islamabad in Pakistan is just one little voice added to the chorus now. That Islam is still alive. And Islam is not a spent force. And Islam can take on the modern West and defeat it. In what sense has the United States been defeated in Afghanistan? In the same sense that they were defeated in Vietnam. Namely, they could not achieve their objectives. That was the defeat. And if Islam can fight the United States and all of the West in Afghanistan, then what is the promise that seems to be apparent now? The promise of what is to come. A message being sent to Venezuela. <laughs> A message being sent to Bolivia, a message being sent to Chile, a message being sent to Nicaragua, a message being sent all around the world where people are being oppressed. That Islam has the promise that it can come to liberate the oppressed of the world. We also see Evidence from events unfolding in Afghanistan that the modern West is in decline. Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica. And it is Pax Americana which is now in decline. The evidence is astonishing and it keeps on mounting. But those political analysts, including those in Pakistan, who have to sing for their supper <laughs> because, because they want to get the articles published in Western newspapers, so they have to, like Vidya Naipaul, they have to write to please the West. They have to cook the food for the taste of the West. <laughs> they are not able to say what I am saying. That the evidence is mounting that the modern West is in decline. The United States for the last 200 years has been intervening militarily with gunboat diplomacy in nearly every single Central American and South American country willy-nilly to change governments, <laughs> invading them, overthrowing governments for the last 200 years. 
And now, what has happened that Venezuela has put a stop to it? The United States has tried everything you could possibly try to overthrow the Venezuelan government. Hugo Chavez slapped them on their faces until they got rid of him. And now Maduro is still holding on. Why can the United States not bring about regime change in its backyard in Venezuela? Why? That for all of these years you have this embarrassing spectacle of the United States circling Venezuela but unable to attack it. What has happened to the lion? Has he lost his teeth? The United States imposed a quarantine on Venezuela that they couldn't get oil because their oil refineries are not working. They didn't have the spare parts. And the Venezuelans were desperately in need of oil. Pakistan, of course, couldn't do it. But Iran did it. Pakistan does not have that profile at all that Iran has. And don't come to me with your criticisms of Shia sectarianism. I'm talking politics now. Iran had the profile. And Iran defied the West and sent five tankers filled with oil to Venezuela. And I was sitting in Trinidad next door to Venezuela watching what's going on. And the American warships are there in the Caribbean Sea and they couldn't stop it. <laughs> they couldn't stop it. The evidence is not there alone. Seven years ago, Russia reclaimed Ukraine. And when Russia reclaimed Ukraine, and because I have studied Surah to the Kef of the Quran, I said, it's time for Imran to celebrate. Because I have studied Surah to the Kef of the Quran. And for seven years, the West has not been able to reverse what happened in Ukraine. They're no closer today than they were seven years ago. Ukraine, sorry, not Ukraine, Crimea, my mistake, Crimea. Crimea is firmly in the hands of Russia. And once you control Crimea, you control the whole of the Black Sea. <laughs> the evidence of the decline of the West is mounting. It was there spectacularly on display in Syria. When they, they manufactured in their own factories, they manufactured ISIS, a CIA creation, a factory owned by the CIA created this ISIS. <laughs> and if they provided all the weapons, state-of-the-art weapons, through Saudi Arabia, of course, their chamcha, and Turkey, of course, their chamcha. And also you have Qatar and others along the line. And they provided them with all the U.S. dollars they needed. And I call them the jazz warriors. <laughs> and they hit me, oh yes, they hit me. And they, they went to work, and they killed and they slaughtered innocent people. And today the same people who did that, and have no remorse, have no regrets, are saying, look at what 
Taliban is doing. I don't use the word Taliban. You never heard me using the word. It's the first time I use the word Taliban. Look at how they're behaving <laughs> in Afghanistan. And they made havoc in Syria. And millions had to leave Syria as refugees. And then what happened? They were defeated. They were halted in their tracks. The West is in decline. And now, in addition to Venezuela, in addition to Crimea, in addition to Syria, Afghanistan. <laughs> and so, when the United States finally jumps out of the frying pan in Afghanistan, in Kabul, as they jumped out of Saigon many years ago, the evidence, I am saying one more time, is mounting for those who have the capacity to see and understand and the integrity to realize that the civilization which has been ruling the world for 300 years is now in decline. But there is for us more from the world of Islam that they can no longer say we belong to the museums of history. There's more for us. And that is our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him. And they know the prophecy. He said that uh, an army will come out of Khorasan with black flags. And no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem, indicating that it is not a Russian army that will liberate Jerusalem. Rather, it will be a Muslim army that will liberate Jerusalem. The late Dr. Israr Ahmad, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on his soul, did excellent work in defining for us ancient Khorasan. And I have benefited from his research. And what he said was that ancient Khorasan comprised of the northwest of Pakistan, what you call KPK, the whole of Afghanistan, the east of Iran, and the north of Afghanistan. That whole area is ancient Khorasan. And when the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that an army will come from Khorasan, and no one will be able to stop it until it reaches Jerusalem. Answer, Afghanistan is the heart of Khorasan. And if the Islamic resistance in Afghanistan has been successful in resisting American occupation of the country to such an extent that the United States is now withdrawing. The evidence can no longer be disputed that what is now happening is validating the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad It is a validation. And if that is so, then all of mankind should now be paying attention to what is happening in Afghanistan and in the world of Islam. Because history is not moving in a haphazard way, helter-skelter. 
rather history is moving in a particular direction towards a particular culmination or end and the Messiah is located at the very heart of the movement of history and the Messiah is connected with Jerusalem and so history is ending with Islam playing a spectacular role I should not have to repeat what I have just said I'm speaking slowly so you can understand it can sink in but our prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam it's time for me to now to look inside I've been looking outside and I've been sending a message from Islamabad to Caracas <laughs> I'll be sending a message from Islamabad to Caracas to Bolivia to Nicaragua to the oppressed of the world who are struggling but having done that now let's look inside our prophet said Allah's blessings be upon him he said my ummah means my community is like the rain I do not know which shower is better the first or the last I came to Pakistan four months ago and I <laughs> astonished Pakistan when I said that I am 82 years of age by the moon and almost 80 by the sun I have been superbly educated, mashallah, and I have traveled extensively in the world, and I have written an, a large number of books which have been received with respect on Islamic eschatology, and so I do have some credentials to speak. And largely due to the internet, we now have a very large number of people who are listening to me. And I said that I don't see the last shower of rain coming from the Arab world. This is not to say that I am speaking condescendingly of the Arabs. Nor do I see it coming from Turkey, where the brainwashing is of to such an extent they don't care that Turkey is a member of NATO. It's, ir it's peripherally important. But Afghanistan said, and I want to begin my praise for Afghanistan now, whether they like it or they don't. That Afghanistan said to Turkey, when NATO leaves, you leave as well. Meaning, after NATO has left, if you are still here, you're in trouble. We take care of you. <laughs> that, it's lovely. That's music in my ears. That Afghanistan is not asleep. So for the critics of Afghanistan, take that and chew it for a while. The brainwashing of the Turkish people and I'm enormously unpopular in Turkey oh sure <laughs> enormously unpopular the brainwashing of the Turkish people is so great that they still cannot recognize that Allah has spoken in the Quran concerning the church and the synagogue and the cathedral and the masjid that you have a duty to fight, to protect it. So how can you take it and convert it to a masjid, a cathedral? The Quran is our guidance, not events taking place in Spain, 
Don't come with that nonsense. When the Quran is here as our guide, why are you running from the Quran? Don't you have any respect? But the Turkish people are still supporting Erdogan, who took Hagia Sophia and converted it to a masjid for the second time, shamefully, disgracefully, sinfully. But look at the Pakistani people. I came here four months ago. I told them this is wrong. The Quran prohibits this. And when we conquer Constantinople, as prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad we are going to return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world. And when we do that, then the prophecy in the Quran will be fulfilled, which is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, that a Christian people will come closest in love and affection for us Muslims. And guess what? Nobody in Pakistan differed with me. If there are people in Pakistan who differ with me, they prefer to stay away from me. So then where will the last shower come from? I don't see it coming from Africa or from Southeast Asia. I have said over and over again these last four months, this is my opinion. I can be wrong. I make mistakes. But my opinion is that the last shower of scholarly rain will come from Pakistan. But it will not come from the Darul alone. And Afghanistan has the same Darul Loom as Pakistan. No difference. No difference. The last shower of scholarly rain will come from the scholarly profile of Dr. Iqbal. Despite mistakes that he made. But I also make mistakes. And the last shower of scholarly rain will come from his student his most distinguished student of Iqbal, the one who responded to Iqbal's call for a reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, and the one who wrote the two-volume book which is available at the back, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. In response to Iqbal, my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana, Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. This is the last shower of scholarly rain. But now, today, we have to agree, we have to accept that the last shower of military rain is coming from Afghanistan and from Khorasan. Whether the Afghan people are able to maintain unity in their ranks or not, because shaitan is always at work to try to bring rivalry and different warlords and disunity and fighting and civil war. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. But so far, the evidence is that they have given a spectacular demonstration that they are the last shower of military rain in this Ummah. Having said that, We now have to turn to other matters which are not so agreeable. <laughs> I said in my lecture in Lahore a week and a half ago, I don't know how long it'll take before Kabul falls. But now it appears as though Kabul is not going to last 
for me, you know, <laughs> another month. <laughs> and when Kabul falls, when this present Yankee government, that's what they deserve to be called, Yankee government in Afghanistan, perishes, and the Islamic Emirate is restored, what are the implications? I now want to tell you this story, and many of those listening to this lecture in different parts of the world are going to be astonished when they hear this. That when there was the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan for about five years, I think 1996 to 2001 perhaps, and Mullah Umar was the head of the government. I was based in New York. And Islam and international relations was my subject. I had been studying. I knew the thought of our foremost scholars on the subject. I had read the works of modern scholars like Dr. Muhammad Hamidullah of Hyderabad Deccan, the Usmania University. And his famous book, The Muslim Conduct of State. I had read the works of Abu, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, who was a Saudi scholar from Saudi Arabia, who did his PhD in Islam and International Relations. And I had his PhD thesis and I studied it. I read the works of Majid Khadouri in John Hopkins University, who translated the Islamic Law of Nations of, um, of uh, Shaibani. And uh, I had been researching Islam and international relations for a long time. And so when the Islamic Emirate appeared on the scene in the mid-90s, I responded to it from New York. Uh, Afghanistan had an ambassador in New York at that time. And he was a very learned man, a very cultured man, refined man. And I was very happy to be in his company. And he had a liking for me. And we became friends, the ambassador. And while I was commenting on the Islamic Emirate as to whether or not it qualified as a Khilafah state, The ambassador was sending, in those days we didn't have the internet, mm. we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have videos, so we had cassettes, audio cassettes. Mm -hmm. So the ambassador was sending audio cassettes to Kabul. I don't know if he's still alive, he may even listen to this lecture, I can't even remember his name now, but what I do remember Abdul Hakim Mujahid, mashallah, mashallah. What I do remember was that this was an educated man. Oh yes, and a cultured man. It was a, it was a joy to be in his company. This is the kind of man that Afghanistan chose to be the ambassador. So he was sending my, the cassettes of my lectures to Kabul, to the government. There were very few of us 
who were specializing on Islam and international affairs, very few. And then he reported to me that Kabul was not in agreement with you, Maulana. We, Kabul, the ulama of the government in Kabul deferred with you. And he pointed two areas. When this lecture is on the internet, they listen to it in Kabul. He said, Kabul deferred with you when you declared that you, Kabul should not be seeking to get UN recognition of the Kabul government as the legitimate government of Afghanistan entitled to sit in the seat of Afghanistan in the United Nations. I said, that's wrong. They said, no, that's right. And so they persisted in their effort to get the United Nations <laughs> to recognize them as the legitimate government of Afghanistan entitled to sit in the Afghan seat in the UN. I hope they have learned their lesson now after 25 years. Because they were wrong and they were misguided at that time. Because the scholars had a Darul Uloom education. That's why. I don't want to be speaking disrespectfully, disrespectfully of the Darul Uloom. But what can I do? I have to point out that the education is deficient. It is inadequate. They are not given the knowledge that they need in the Darulum for the conduct of a modern state. How do you, how do you establish the Khilafah state in the modern age? The second thing the ambassador said to me was that I had said that the Afghan paper money, they call it the Afghan, in Pakistan it's called the rupee. I said that the Afghan is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram. They said no. Mufti said no. <laughs> the muftis of Afghanistan like the Muftis of Pakistan, deferred with me. Meaning, your Mufti, your Mufti Azam, is still of the view that your paper money is halal. I don't know what to do to contain my anger with this rubbish. My language now is harsh, but I have the right to be harsh in my language because our people are suffering. If you want to establish a Khilafah state, then I'm going to look at your economy and I'll tell you very quickly whether you are Khilafah state or you are bogus. So the ambassador said, Kabul differs with you. Kabul believes that the paper money is halal. <laughs> 25 years have passed. And I don't know. I don't even know if the ambassador is still alive. I'd love to meet with him. But I don't know whether Kabul has learned any lessons since then. And so when this Yankee government falls, which seems inevitable, and the Islamic Emirate is restored, the easy part is now finished, fighting the Americans. That was the easy part. And the difficult part now begins. And that is how to establish an authentic Khilafah state 
in the modern age. And I have to share with you my conviction the Yodarulum education cannot prepare you to do that work. So do not be surprised if you see the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan faltering and making mistake after mistake. Don't be surprised. I don't wish this at all. I wish them success. But there is no substitute for knowledge. And the last shower of scholarly rain is not coming in Afghanistan. Because all that Afghanistan has is the Darul Ulum. And the Darul Ulum of Afghanistan is no different from the Darul Ulum of Pakistan. If A Khilafah state is to be restored in Afghanistan. How do you proceed? I will use a brief time on this subject because this requires hours and hours of lecturing. The first thing about the Khilafah state it will be disgraceful <laughs> If you declare yourself an Islamic Emirate and then Afghan is fighting against Afghan and you have all different kinds of groups splintering and civil war amongst them you are fighting the Americans now you are fighting your own brothers so if this is what is going to come after Kabul falls this can't be a Khilafah state. Because the Khilafah state has an Amir and it has a Sam'u wa Da'at wa Ta'atu, discipline. A united community led by an Amir and a disciplined community, not anarchy and chaos and fighting with each other and disunity in your ranks. Number two, it would not take long for us to determine a Khilafah state is a state which functions in accordance with what the Quran has ordained. Mm. What is the definition of a Khilafah state in the Quran? Does Afghanistan even know? Pakistan does not know, I know that. But does Afghanistan even know what is a Khilafah state? What is the definition of the Khilafah state in the Quran? This lecture is meant to help them in Kabul. Allah spoke subhanahu wa ta'ala to the angels and he said ba'da'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa i'm going to place on earth one who will be khalifa bismillah So who is the Khalifa? And when will he come? Is it Adam alayhi salam? But he didn't create any state. No, no, no. Go to the Quran. Let the Quran answer that question. And Allah speaks in the Quran and he addresses Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the Prophet David. And he says to him, Ya Dawood, O oh David, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. 
We are hereby appointing you as Khalifa on earth. Fakhum bain al nasi bil haqq. You have the substance of the Khilafah state and you have the form of the Khilafah state. The substance of the Khilafah state is located here and the form of the Khilafah state is located in the Sharia which was sent to a particular Ummah. So the Khilafah state that Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, will establish the holy state for my Christian brothers in Russia who will be listening to this lecture. The holy state that Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, will establish in Jerusalem when he comes, will have the same substance as the holy state or the Khilafah state established by Imam al-Mahdi. The substance would be the same, but the form would differ. So there is a form of the holy state established by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, a second form established by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and a third one established when Nabi Isa or Jesus returned. But we are now not concerned with the form. We're concerned with the substance. And Allah said that the substance of the Khilafah state, فَخْكُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ that you must establish government, you must establish law, you must rule on the basis of truth. And for this Ummah, truth comes from the Quran. For that Ummah, truth comes from the Torah and the Gospel until Nabi Isa Islam returns and then he will teach them the Quran as well. <laughs> and so can you establish an Khilafah state in Afghanistan without the Quran? Answer me! <laughs> you cannot establish a Khilafah state in Afghanistan without the Quran. Do you know how to study the Quran? Does the Darul even know how to study the Quran? Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. I'm taking my time today because I want these words to reach them. And I'm speaking slowly so you can translate it to Pashto and to Farsi for them. I'm speaking slowly. Allah says in the Quran that He has sent down this book. He says it in Surah Al-Nahl. Tibyanan likulli shay to explain all things. Did you hear that? Subkuch. To explain all things. Well then, one of the most mysterious things that has ever occurred in history, which has spectacularly changed the world, and is constantly changing the world and is dismantling the religious way of life is modern western civilization is it possible that the Quran has no explanation 
of modern Western civilization acts the Darulum. They have no answer. Neither in Pakistan nor in Afghanistan. Because they don't know how to study the Quran. I am not in speaking, my people. I'm not hitting the Islamic resistance in Afghanistan. No, no, no. I'm just sharing with you the plain truth. The plain truth is that you do not have the knowledge of the Quran with which to be able to establish the Khilafah state in an age when modern Western civilization dominates the world. Because your Darul Loom does not have the knowledge. But it's worse than that. It's worse than that. They know me. Of course they know me. I... I sat with the ambassador. He invited me, Abdul, ha Abdul Hamid, Abdul Hakim Mujahid. Dr. Abdul Hakim Mujahid. He invited me to his home for lunch. Kabuli Palau. It was brown in color. And we sat down and we ate. Kabuli, the ambassador and myself. When we were finished eating, he said, Sheikh Imran, I have good news for you. <laughs> I said, what is it? He says, Kabul is ready to meet with you. Meaning the government. They are ready to meet with you now. And there is a conference in Lahore that you will be attending and they have decided that they will send a delegation to Lahore to meet with you. That was good news. But two days later 9-11 took place. <laughs> two days later 9-11 took place. And I never heard, I never saw the ambassador again. And for all these 20 years, I've never had any contact with Kabul. Never. But they knew me because they were ready to meet with me. And for 25 years now, I've been explaining and teaching the Quran as it explains the world today. This is Islamic eschatology. And for 25 years, the Darul Looms have all shut their doors on me. In Britain, they closed the doors of the masjid as well on me. They put their heads down in the sand and bury their heads there like ostriches and pretend that the modern world, modern Western civilization <laughs> does not exist. That's not the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad The Sunnah of the Prophet is that he would study carefully his strategic environment. And having studied his strategic environment, and for today, for Kabul, at the top of the list of the strategic environment, is the world which has come into being through modern Western civilization, with the United Nations organization, with the International Monetary Fund, and with the virus and the vaccine. Our Prophet would not only study the strategic environment, but he will then go on to take initiatives 
meant to change the strategic environment and make it more favorable for him. We don't have the time to give a lecture on that subject today, except to say that it was precisely such an initiative which led to Hudaybiyah. And when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was concluded, Allah responded with a surah entitled Surah Al-Fatih. And he began the surah by saying, Inna fatan, fatihna laka fatihan mubina. We have ordained for you a manifest victory. Manifest victory. Hmm? And so Kabul would have to study the strategic environment following the sunnah of the Prophet and take initiatives in order to modify the strategic environment and make it more favorable for him. That is the sunnah. When um, When Kabul wakes up, and when you create a generation of scholars who are capable of turning to the Qur'an to deliver the substance of a Khilafah state, then Kabul will have to... <coughs> deliver to the world, spectacularly so. And the diplomats in Islamabad, in the foreign ministry, will be left, will be left wondering, <laughs> where did this come from? Kabul will give to the world, listen carefully, not just what is a Khilafah state, but what is the Islamic conception of an international order? What is the Islamic conception of an international order? What is Pax Islamica? The modern West gave us Pax Britannica and gave us Pax Americana. And uh, Israel is now poised to deliver Pax Judaica. How does that differ from Pax Islamica? They don't teach this subject in the Darul Um. And I cannot today, in the limited time that we have, I can't give you a lecture today on the Islamic conception of an international order or Pax Islamica. That will have to wait for another day. But it is a beautiful subject. The Islamic conception of an international order which emerges from the Quran. But Kabul will have to do more than that. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> if you want to establish a genuine Islamic a Khilafah state because the first thing we look at to judge whether or not you are a Khilafah state is not your external relations <laughs> it's your economy it's your economy and if you give us a bogus economy, like the one which obtains in Pakistan, like the one which obtains in Pakistan, a bogus economy, an economy which produces over time slave masters and slaves. <laughs> an economy which produces slave masters and slaves. 
That's what Pakistan has produced over so long. And there's nothing in the horizon, nothing, nothing, nothing which is challenging it. Your muftis and your maulanas and your shuyuk and your Islamic organizations have mounted no challenge to the economy. None. They are busy either eating biryani and going home and sleep or picking up boxing gloves for their tamasha. They open the braille with this, that, the other. You know, Ayub Khan wrote the book in the 1950s, Friends Not Masters. He was sending a message to the West that we are prepared to be friends with you, but we're not going to be your slaves. But the Latin American diplomat Juan Domingo Alvarado. He wrote a more beautiful book. <laughs> the, title, the title of his book was Sharks and Sardines. And that's what we have today in the economy. Sharks and sardines. The sardines are those who have to leave their wives and their children in the village because if they're in the village, they can only earn about 12,000 a month. But village can't pay anything better than that. And they have to leave the village and come to Islamabad. And when they come to Islamabad, then because Islamabad doesn't have knowledge, because no one is teaching Islamabad, so they have no knowledge. So they believe that the market wage is a valid wage. And if the market says that the wage for the cook, Kansama, is 15,000 or 18,000, and the wage for the chowkidar or the security guard is 16,000, and the wage for the gardener is 15,000, and we pay the market wage and we can go home and sleep. We can go in the masjid, perform our salat. We are good Muslims. We are paying the market wage. <laughs> well, I have a message for you, Afghanistan. Pakistan has failed and failed miserably. And there's nothing in the horizon to see that we can see that there is any hope for Pakistan to change their economy. But we will judge you in Afghanistan based on your economy. Based on your economy. If you're paying that man that wage and his wife and children have to remain in the village and he doesn't have the means to even go back every weekend. So he'll go back once every few months and see. So the children, <laughs> they don't have papa. Every night, the children are going to sleep and they don't have papa. But your children have papa. You're paying him the wage of a slave. Because you will not put your son to work for that wage. But that's the wage of a slave. But they don't know it, they're innocent. Nobody taught them the subject. So Afghanistan, you're going to have to teach Pakistan. That's what our message I'm sending to you. You have to tell Pakistan, our prophet said, he said, give the slave to eat the food that you eat. And give your slave to wear the clothes that you wear. 
And mashallah, there are Pakistanis who are very kind to their servants and treat them very nicely, alhamdulillah. I just got the news. I, I spent the night in um, Nauchela, beautiful city, green and nice. And I learned that uh, the, 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 the man who is employing the Chaukidar, he built a house for him. <laughs> so that his wife and children can come. So the children will have Papa. So this is Pakistan. But what do you do? Give your slave to eat the food that you eat. And give him to wear the clothes that you wear. Answer. Until such time as you can eliminate riba from the economy, you can't be called a killer for state. So we'll judge Kabul. We'll judge Afghanistan based on the economy. Until such time as you can eliminate riba, from the economy and then the market wage will be a just wage that with this wage this man is able to maintain his family he can bring his wife and children from the village he can get a home he can spend enough to be able to maintain them until such time what do you do answer if you have to employ servants, then you have to make them part of your family. You cannot negotiate a wage with them. No. You have to find out what are his needs. How can I get him to bring his wife and his children so the children can have papa? How can I provide a place for them to live? They must have enough food to eat. They must have clothes to wear. If this man is going to work for me full time, full time, then I have to ensure that his family is taken care of. But not, this is for Pakistan, but for Afghanistan, it is not possible to restore the economy that the Khilafah state requires if you continue to have this bogus monetary system. So what they could not do 25 years ago, may Allah open a door that they'll now be able to see the light and bring dinar and dirham as legal tender in Afghanistan. Nobody in Pakistan is calling for that. <laughs> no mufti is saying that this paper money is haram, none. Secondly, not only do you have to bring dinar and dirham back as legal tender, but you have to ensure that you are not a member state of the IMF because the IMF prohibits the use of gold as money. And forget it about being a member of the United Nations. If Afghanistan establishes that profile, Pakistan, you're in trouble. Oh, yes. <laughs> Secondly, you cannot have a banking system in Afghanistan with money being lent on interest to the commercial banks, to the front door. And then money being lent on interest to the Islamic banks, to the back door. The banking system has to go. And those who have money and want to invest, instead of lending it on interest, must do like all others and come in the market and invest. 
When I come back, inshallah, if Allah allows me to come back, I will teach the subject of riba, which is fundamental for successfully establishing a Khilafah state. As of today, the Darul Um has failed. The Darul Um has failed and failed miserably in teaching the subject of riba. <laughs> Whereas riba of the modern age has come from Dajjal and is meant to enslave you. So if there is to be an, a Khilafah state in Afghanistan, tell them we're going to be looking at your economy. And as of now, you don't have the knowledge to deal with the economy in the modern world. You don't have that knowledge. You need to be humble and learn from others. Pakistan, the elite, they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn. But the students, the university students, mashallah, they are hungry for knowledge in Pakistan. So I'm confident that we'll have a new generation of scholars in Pakistan tomorrow. But the same thing can happen in Afghanistan. I met with a very senior government official. He came to see me in Peshawar. And he agreed with me that the Darul Um was not doing the job it's supposed to be doing. And he said to me, I want to establish an institution of Islamic studies here in Peshawar. We shall bring the correct Islam from the Quran and will be taught all over KPK and that Afghanistan can benefit. I said, if you want to do that, I'm here to help you. <laughs> I'm here to help you with that. And in that effort of teaching, the economy to occupies the most important position. We now move on. The world will be watching Afghanistan now. 25 years ago, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have Google. We didn't have uh, something called Twitter. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know about them, but I heard about them. But today, 25 years later, you are on the stage of the world. Everything that is going to happen in Afghanistan is going to be recorded on these phones. And they'll be sent out. And they'll be broadcast all over the world. And you're going to face a public relations disaster if you make mistakes. So this is my warning to you. Nabi Muhammad wasalam, I want you to tell me whether this is possible in KPK and Afghanistan. Hear it, eh? And then tell me, is it possible or not? Nabi Muhammad was a young wife. Her name was Aisha. Radiallahu ta'ala. And uh, they used to run races with each other. And sometimes he would beat her, sometimes she would beat him. So I asked, where did they run the races? Inside the bedroom? Nabi Muhammad Islam, had a young wife whose name was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And husband and wife used to run race, races. And sometimes he would beat her. Me, good, he's in good shape, huh? He could beat her. And sometimes she would beat him. So, did they run the races inside the bedroom? <laughs> huh? 
but I <laughs> no. <laughs> they were running the races outside. Can you do that today in KPK? Can you do that today in Afghanistan? But I uh, can you do it today? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Islam that the world should see. That is not Islam. The Prophet said, prepare yourself for this one, eh? This is Sahih Muslim. He said, when woman makes sijda, meaning in the masjid, not in their homes. When woman makes sijda, they must remain in sijda longer than the men. Did you ever hear this? Kabi sunab me? Never. <laughs> they never heard it. They must remain in Sijda longer than the men. Why? Because some of the men might not have enough cloth to cover themselves properly. And if a woman were to raise her head too quickly, it would be an unwelcome sight. So what? Were they naked? What kind of clothes did the men wear? And uh, women were in the masjid? Did the Prophet allow women to pray in the masjid? I can't hear you. I don't you had dinner already, no? Did Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, did he allow women to pray in the masjid, yes or no? Yes. This is Islam. <laughs> this is Islam. <laughs> Where women had rights to pray in the masjid. Do women come to the masjid for Salatul Jummah in Pakistan? No. 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 I lived in Malaysia for many years as well. I never saw a woman in the masjid in Malaysia. No. So this is going to be Islam on display. Is this a valid Khilafah state or is it a bogus Khilafah state? where women are not allowed in the masjid. He said, when the woman, oh no, the clothing now for the men, is that you have two pieces of clothing as a man. Two pieces. The lower portion has to be tailored in such a way you could jump on a donkey. You could ride a horse, you could ride a camel. So it's like this. The shalwal, perfect, perfect shalwal. And it has to be baggy. If it's tight and you go on the horse, it'll tear. <laughs> so you have the perfect the shalwal here. Yeah? But in addition to the lower garment, you have to have an upper garment. And the upper garment has to be long enough that when you go down in sijda, you will not present an indecent spectacle to those behind you. Because if you do that, not because of a shortage of cloth, but because you want to follow the West, then I have a surprise for you. Allah will take your salat and throw it back in your face. If you perform salat with clothing, that when you go down in Sijda, you present an indecent spectacle. 
So now then, he said, when the men come to the masjid, the best role for the men is the first. And the most dangerous is the last. Is it because of scorpions? What is there making it dangerous? And the, first, the best role for the woman is the last. And the most dangerous is the first. Is it because of scorpions? No. no. Huh? No. You know the answer. As the row of the men at the front fills up, and the row of the women from the back fills up, the two will come close to each other. Thank Allah that he did not put the women in the front and men in the back. Because no man will be able to concentrate on his salat. None. <laughs> That's elementary common sense. Okay? So thank Allah he put the woman in the back. So the men are in front. So the men could concentrate on Allah. But then did they have a shortage of cloth? That they couldn't put a parda? Or they could put palm leaves and make a, a, a barrier? No, no, no. The masjid was arranged in this way by Allah himself. He informed the Prophet that men and women in Islam prayed in the same space. Men and women prayed in Islam in the same space with no barrier in between no parda in between that is why the last row was dangerous for the men and the first row for the women was dangerous eh? particularly when you're young even when you're old is difficult but when you're young the hormones are raging, you see? And so, this is Islam. Do you know anywhere in the world today where men and women pray together in the same space? Have you ever seen it? Huh? Have you ever seen it anywhere? Well, wait. When Imam al-Mahdi comes, and the Khilafah state is restored. Whether you like it or you don't, men and women will pray the way they prayed in Medina. This is Islam. Can this ever come to Afghanistan? All I am doing is sending a message. I don't know whether it will reach them or not. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is coming back to Medina and he's riding a camel and the sun is very hot and there is this woman walking on the road so he stopped his camel and he offered her a ride if she accepts it She'll be sitting behind him on the camel. If she's unbalanced, she'll have to hold his, hold his back. She said, I wished, I longed to accept the invitation, but my husband is a jealous man, so I had to decline. So my question is, can you... Can you do that in KPK? Can you do that in Afghanistan? Huh? Can you stop your, your horse or your camel and give a woman a ride? She's a stranger. This is Islam. This is Islam. So will this be a valid Khilafah state or a bogus Khilafah state? Nabi Muhammad to Islam went to the home of a companion and while he was there he felt lice in his head 
in those days, you know, the men had more hair. I'm trying to grow mine a little bit now. In KPK, I see men like the prophet used to have long, long hair. You know what she did? The wife of the companion. She put him to sit down. And in the presence of her husband, she went with her fingers, searching in his hair to take out the lice. Can you do this in KPK? <laughs> Can you do this in Afghanistan? No. <laughs> this is Islam. This is Islam. <laughs> so will this be a valid Khilafah state or a bogus Khilafah state? I've taken a lot of your time today, I know it. But I've not exhausted the subject. What I have done is to show, number one, that our, our sons in Afghanistan, our brothers in Afghanistan, have delivered to the world a spectacular demonstration of evidence that Islam is not in a museum. It is not a spent force. That Islam is not only still alive, but it has the capacity to resist the most powerful civilization in the world. And that's bad news for Israel. Mm -hmm. What I've done today is to show mm -hmm. compelling evidence that modern Western civilization is in decline, that Pax Americana is de in decline. I showed you evidence from, from uh, Venezuela, I showed you Crimea, I showed you Syria, and then I went to Afghanistan. Hmm? I then turned to say to you that what is happening in Afghanistan is validating the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad that a Muslim army is destined to come out of Afghanistan, of Khorasan, and no one will be able to stop it until it reaches Jerusalem. I then went on to tell you about my own relationship with the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan 25 years ago when I was in New York and I was specializing in Islam and international relations. After that I went to eschatology and since then it had been eschatology but at that time it was Islam and international relations. And how the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan differed with me on two very important issues pertaining to how should a Khilafah state function? Number one was membership in the United Nations and hence membership in the International Monetary Fund and therefore membership in the, you remember, World Health Organization, virus, vaccine. Huh? <laughs> Every order they give you got to obey. You know, if governments were to vanish, there'd be no virus. And there be no vaccine. It's only because of governments. <laughs> it's only because of governments that the virus exists and the vaccine exists, really. And of course, there is the possibility that they are manufacturing in laboratories and therefore they can bring out more and more dangerous viruses. I then went on to point out how the Darulung at that time could not produce the scholarship to guide Kabul properly and Kabul made mistakes and we, don't, we don't know whether in 25 years the Darulum has been able to produce better scholars in Afghanistan that is a different thinking now that the scholarship now that was not there 25 years ago and then we ended by pointing out that without that scholarship, you cannot establish a Khilafah state. So your Amirate will not qualify as a Khilafah state. We spoke about the role of the Quran and truth. We spoke about the substance of the Khilafah state and the form.
deferring because of Sharia, but the substance is the Quran. And if you don't have even the methodology for study the Quran, how can you derive from the Quran that we should explain the reality of the world today? And the Darul Room has failed, has failed. We spoke about the last shower of rain. And we say, while the last shower of military rain is coming from there, the last shower of scholarly rain is not coming from there. It's coming from here, from the young ones in Pakistan. And so Afghanistan will have to learn. Afghanistan will have to humble itself and seek knowledge. And if you do not seek knowledge, if you remain with the arrogance of the Darulum, that we have all the knowledge, we don't need to learn from you. Then the warning was, this is not 25 years ago. Today, everybody have a smartphone with a, we can take photographs. And every single mistake that you make, once your emirate is established, will be broadcast all over the world and you will become the laughing stock of all of mankind. And I proceeded to show where you are going to have your great effort, tired, namely, number one, your conception of an international order, but more importantly, your economy. And finally, your fidelity to the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and in this respect, I mentioned many things about women. That this is Islam and you don't have Islam. We pray that Allah might guide our brothers. I've made no comments on Taliban. I've never mentioned the name Taliban. So don't send me any emails directing me attention, this, that, that and the other. The micro-analysis of what is happening in Afghanistan is not my business. I am not a scholar of that. You have scholars in Pakistan who are capable of doing that better than me. I am not a scholar of micro-analysis of what is happening in Pakistan. It's not my business. I'm dealing with macro-analysis and I'm speaking only in the context of Islam. May Allah grant that Afghanistan may get the knowledge with which to be able to restore a khilaf state. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Ameen. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka inta tawabur rahim barahmatika ya ahram ar-rahimin. Ameen.